This is the latest in our series of webinars that we've hosted this spring, where we've tried to look at some of the issues that have been out there in crops all across the country. So this morning's webinar will hopefully do the same. We'll try to address some of the issues that are out there. And while the rain yesterday was of huge benefit to many crops around the country, there are still plenty of issues out there that we have to address over the coming weeks. So hopefully in the next hour or so, we will address some of those issues. For any of you that are not familiar with the, the format of these webinars so far, basically what we do is we have three different sections. So we deal with a particular topic in each section, and then we revert back to our panel where we ask our panel of experts some of the questions to deal with some of the issues that we've been highlighting in the videos. At that stage then, we'd ask you to get involved using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. So send your questions through to us at that stage, and hopefully we'll be able to deal with as many of those questions as we possibly can through the, throughout the session. This webinar is being recorded, so in case you have to go away or you have to go and do something, uh, we will be recording this uh, webinar. It will be available then later on via our Chagas Crops YouTube channel. Um, on, so you'll be, able to, you'll be able to see or view whatever you miss later on this evening. For anybody that um, looks for IASIS points or wants to uh, register for IASIS points, the fact that you registered on the webinar this morning means that we will be able to forward on your details so you'll get a credit for those IASIS points. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce the first section here, which is looking at how we use plant protection products. So Francis Quigley and uh, Dermot Forrestal are looking at the machinery end of it and nozzle technology and how nozzle technology can be used in order to make sure that we apply our plant protection products as efficiently as we possibly can. Here on Collins then, our crop specialist, will look at Stripe, which is the Department of Agriculture Regulations, which are designed to reduce the impact of plant protection products on the environment. And that's a very important section. But first of all, we're going to go to Michael Hennessy, who's in a chemical st store. And in an era where registrations on chemicals are changing all the time, it's important that we know what's in the store. So Mike is going to take us through how we might manage the chemicals in our chemical store. Hi, my name is Michael Hennessy. I'm here on a farm in Kildare, and we're here to look at the chemical store, but more really about the pesticides that are being stored in that chemical store. So before we get to the pesticides part of it, I just want to say a small little bit around the chemical store itself. So there's a couple of things you just need to make sure you have in place. The first one, you have a, a door of which you can lock, like this one, a sign uh, clearly stating where uh, that it is a chemical store. But then obviously within the store, there's some other things that needs to be bonded, of which this store is here. Um, but you also need a few things that if you do get inspected. So if you get inspected, there's a number of things that you just need to have on hand for the inspector. So you need records of all the field records out there you need records of the purchases of all the pesticides as well. When you go into the store then, there's a number of things you need inside there as well. You need evidence of safety equipment, such as masks and, uh, and overalls and gloves. Uh, and you also uh, need measuring evidence of measuring equipment in there as well. And lastly, you should have, and always should have within the store, a, a bucket of sand or, or, or something like that to contain any spillages within the store. If you have all those in place, you should be okay for inspection. So now to talk about the management of plant protection products within your store. There's three main types that you're going to have in your store. The first one is going to be the ones you can use every day. They're perfectly legal to use. There's no problem with those. The second one is the ones that are going out of date in 2021. They're a particular category in their own. And the last one is the ones that have already gone out of date and you cannot use those anymore. And we'll go through all of those three now in a second. Okay, so now what I want to focus on is the plant protection products in your store and have a look at some of those. So the first one I want to have a look at, there's a number of chemicals here, but it's really the active ingredient in them. So we have Bravo in this one here and Bravo in this one here, or Chlorotonil, and we have uh, Dimetoweight in this one here. All of those products are, uh, they can't be used anymore. The use update was last year. So those ones, they have to be stored safely in your store and then gotten rid of uh, through a registered, um, Disposal expert and you need to keep a receipt of that for the department. To move on to the next category then, we have a category here that contains um, epoxyconazole. And epoxyconazole is also, it's in its use up phase and it must be used up um, by the uh, end of this season. So essentially we have enough in here, in these various different products here, for about four hectares. That should absolutely be used up on all stores. So if you have epoxyconazole, uh, use that up this year. 
Now we're on to the next one, next category then, which is probably the most tricky here. Any of these products I have in front of me here, all of these products can be used this year and next year, no problem at all. The problem is we've lots of bits of cans. So when we put some of these cans together, they're very similar kind of products, we can stick all of those together as we're going out spraying. That here is enough to do four hectares. So it's four hectares you don't have to buy and get rid of all these cans. For this down here, beet sprays down here, again, two small cans, enough to get you out for about two hectares. And similarly with the insecticides down here, very similar type pyrethroid insecticides, enough there for about three hectares, more than enough to, to, that, that you don't have to buy this year. So there's never been a better year than this year to have a look at all the products in your store. You really want to challenge your agronomist or your advisor to have a look at everything in your store and make sure you pick out all those products that can be used this year and use them this year. Anything that can't, store them for disposal later. We're all aware of the requirement to keep pesticides out of our water courses and there are plenty of safeguards in place to help us to do that. But compliance with buffer zones is a fundament, fundamental part of the sustainable use directive. So buffer zones apply to all water bodies and are measured from the top of the bank where that red and white pole is there. Now these buffer zones can be on pesticides can be as small as one meter or can be as wide as 30 meters. Uh, but typically a lot of these are five meters. But details on the buffer zone requirement for each product is on the label. Stripe or surface water tool for reducing the impact of pesticides in the environment is a mechanism that we can use to reduce these buffer zones. So there are three ways that we can reduce the buffer zone on a pesticide. One is by using department approved drift reducing nozzles. So these nozzles can reduce drift by 50%, 75% or 90%. But we can also reduce the buffer zone by reducing the rate of the product applied. And thirdly, we can reduce the buffer zone by a combination of using drift reduction nozzles and reducing the rate. But it's very important to consult the PCRD website when, reducing drift, when using drift reduction nozzles to work out the exact buffer uh, zone requirement. And finally, it's very important to mention that there are safeguard zones around drinking water abstraction points, and these can range from 5 metres out to 200 metres. But Stripe does not reduce these buffer zones. On modern crop farms, the spend on plant protection products, fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, can range anywhere from 150 euros per hectare right up to 300 euros per hectare. So it's important that we get those products applied to the crop evenly and accurately. And that's the role of the sprayer. And on the sprayer itself, probably the most important component is actually the cheapest one or the least expensive one. And that's the nozzle tip. Because these, the selection of the right nozzle will determine uh, the correct water application rate, the correct application rate of the chemical itself, and the correct spray distribution on the, on the plant itself. So correct nozzle choice is hugely important. So where do you start? Uh, how do you select the nozzles for your sprayer? The first protocol really is the, the label of the product itself, because it will give guidance in terms of the required water volume per acre or per hectare, and also the, the required spray quality or spray size distribution. So that's the starting point. And then when, when, that's, when that's decided, we can pick nozzles. And today the nozzles are actually all color coded. So these blue nozzles are a particular size and a particular output. So we can pick the nozzles and fit them to the sprayer. Whereas the choice is often between the type of nozzle, a standard flat fan nozzle or a low drift nozzle. This one here is actually an air induction nozzle. And this nozzle, by taking air in as, it's applied, as the chemical is being applied to the crop, it changes the size distribution of the droplets hugely. We have much larger droplets from this, much less prone to drift, uh, and, and much, much more better targeted on the crop itself. Okay, so I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, about nozzle choice and uh, the effect it has on drift. 
I suppose first thing we need to do is just kind of understand uh, what drift is. Uh, drift is, you know, any particles are of our spray that are not landing in the target location. So obviously as we're driving across the field, we're spraying down and we're trying to hit the, the crop or the ground or whatever uh, our target is. Um, it, if we have drift that some of our particles are moving away uh, from that location and they're going to land somewhere else. Uh, where it becomes more of an issue is obviously the closer we get to a, a headland or a boundary. Um, in that case then any drift that we have will tend to, to go beyond the boundary and may end up in water courses and that's, how we, uh, that's why we need to control drift and obviously more importantly control drift the closer we get to a boundary. Here we're just looking at um, our standard fat fan nozzle and the AIXR uh, nozzle from TJet. So the AIXR nozzle, this is a, an air induction uh, nozzle and the XR is the extended range. So basically what this uh, nozzle, it has two orifices, it has an orifice here at the back and a second orifice uh, here at this end. So the orifice here at the back is actually controlling the flow of the liquid uh, into the nozzle and then the uh, outlet here uh, at the top is uh, controlling the actual droplet size. Now we also have two inlets here on the side of it. So this is actually taking air in to the nozzle here and it's actually mixing uh, with the liquid inside and it's actually forming a, a coating uh, around a bubble of air uh, to increase the droplet size. Okay, so we're just going to take a look at, uh, we'll start here uh, with our O4 red nozzles and we'll just have a look at the, the spray quality from those. First one we're going to start with is just our standard fan nozzle. So we have our standard fan, and you can see you know, we have our 110 degree fan. Uh, so we're getting a relatively small droplet size. We are getting a little bit of drift, uh, better, but there is a certain amount of drift uh, floating away here behind us. So if we change over to the AIXR, so the air induction uh, you can see the droplet size now has actually increased quite dramatically. Uh, the amount of drift uh, from behind, uh, we're still getting a very small amount of drift uh, coming away from behind it, but it's it's greatly reduced. Um, so those droplets, again, we're getting the same application rate, so it's the same uh, rate of liquid that's coming uh, because this is still a red uh, nozzle. So the air induction nozzles can be used in most situations. But the, the, the droplet distribution size is different, so they're not, they're not perfect for all situations. Where your target is very small, such as with a small grass, for instance, with a herbicide, you, may, you, you would be better with a standard nozzle than this. So for most growers, the best option is actually to fit both types of nozzle to their sprayer, to their nozzle holders. So if they're both a blue O3 nozzle, it means they can switch from a low drift nozzle to a standard nozzle and vice versa depending on the weather conditions and the crop situation that you're doing without influencing anything else in terms of the calibration forward speed and so on. So to have both types of, of the nozzle at the same size on the holder is the best option. Okay. Uh, thanks guys for that. So I'm just going to ask Francis and Dermot and Kieran just to come in there and answer a few <coughs> questions. Um, so Francis, I'm going to start with you first. I mean, there was some great footage there of how you how we're drift reducing nozzles reduce drift. But should farmers really be just lowering the water volume application rate and use those low drift nozzles? Is that the easiest way of reducing drift? I suppose, you know, people do need to just bear in mind that, you know, by going to the, the smaller nozzles, like they're going to and going to lower application rates, they just need to be careful uh, that their uh, product is still getting to the target location. So by going to those, uh, maybe going from, let's say, from a blue nozzle down to you know, a yellow nozzle, um, we are going to be reducing the water volumes. So you do need to check your label. Most labels will give you a guide on the, the volume of water that's required. And you'll see maybe that might be between 100 maybe and 300 litres of water. But it will also, under that, underneath that, maybe give a bit further detail as to when that higher water volume is needed. So maybe if the crop is at a high risk um, uh, or if the crop is dense, you know, you may need those higher water volumes. So people just do need to be, do need to be careful uh, not to be rushing to lower water volumes, uh, particularly in dense crops where they, where they need to get through a, a canopy. 
um, to make sure they get accurate coverage across the field. Yeah, and potatoes yeah. comes to mind from that point of view, especially when you're trying to come throw a blight. Uh, sometimes if you cut down the, the water volume, you don't get good penetration of those big canopies. So uh, very good point. The other point there just as well, Francis, while I have you, in terms of working pressure on the sprayer and the forward speed, does that have much of an impact on, on drift? It's, it does, Shay. Um, you know, like as we increase forward speed, you know, if we are, let's say we're on the same nozzle, you know, our pressure is actually going to have to increase to maintain that application rate. So even if we just take a standard blue nozzle and, and you know, there is uh, charts available uh, that people can refer to, you know, to get their, their forward speed and their application rates right. But if we just take an example there of um, our, our blue nozzle, and maybe doing a, an application rate of 140 litres uh, per hectare. Um, at seven kilometres per hour, you're talking about a spray pressure of 1.5 uh, bar uh, to get that application rate. Your spray quality at that stage is medium. You know, and with the same nozzle, go to eight kilometres per hour, uh, you're going to have to increase your pressure, pressure up to two bars. So you're going to, uh, and your spray quality is going to fine there straight away. You know, and that's only just one kilometre. As you move up along, obviously 10 kilometres, you've gone to three bar and 12 kilometers, you've gone up as far as four bar, Joe, and your spray quality constantly, you, you know, you're int introducing higher pressure. So you're atomizing uh, that liquid more. So it is going to be more prone to, to drift. And do you, do you reduce the, the higher or increased pressure for low drift nozzles versus, versus flat fans? Is there any difference there? Well, again, like if people, they will, if they, if they check the charts for the nozzle that they're going to, you know, it's important just to see there is an actual um, standardized, uh, 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 we'll say spray quality, Joe, you know, list, and that will be on all of those uh, charts for each particular nozzle, Joe. You know, so, you know, it gives you, you know, fine, medium, coarse, very coarse up along. So do check uh, the, the, your working pressure. Uh, for your nozzle, Joe, to make sure that that's very quality, Joe, to give you a guide yeah. straight away before. And you. I think it's important that everybody realise that there is a specific recommendation for each nozzle in each situation, so they need to need to need to consult those charts, as you say. Um, Dermot, just moving over to, you, I mean, like Francis said, there's a whole load of varieties and nozzles and colours and shapes and sizes and all that sort of Karen. Is it not just easiest? And I know you're I'm kind of making the point not to, but is it not just easiest pick a low drift nozzle, stick with it through the season, and away you go? Yeah, there's a temptation to do that. And, you know, taking what Kieran spoke about in terms of stripe, the temptation might be to go for the 90% drift reduction nozzle. But that brings you into a, quite a coarse spectrum of droplets. You know, they're in the, in the category list that Francis just spoke about there. They would be extremely coarse or ultra coarse. So your deposition at that point, or, or more, more importantly, your coverage might not be as good with those, with those, with those nozzles. So I would say a more intermediary uh, air induction nozzle, uh, ones that maybe would give you something in the region of 50% drift are a more universal tool. And look, as Francis explained there, there's nozzle charts there that make the selection very easy. So if you have three or four nozzle positions on each holder where you just flick between them, the thing to do there is have a standard flat fan nozzle, maybe a moderate 50% uh, reduction uh, air induction nozzle. And if you need it, a 90% uh, drift reduction air induction nozzle, if you need to benefit from that or to use that in the stripe sort of scenario. I think that's the, probably the most practical thing to do. But be careful that there's always a trade-off between drift reduction, if you like, and coverage, which for some products won't affect efficacy at all. But for other products where you have small targets, they will affect efficacy to some extent. And is there, Darren, when you're talking about efficacy, is there a kind of a water volume that you would recommend that farmers use on cereals or does that change from product to product? It, yeah, it does change from product to product. Look, the, the manufacturers of the products are very cautious. Many of them will stick with what they've tested the product at, which is 200 litres uh, applica per application rate 200 litres per hectare and stick to that. Many growers know that they can go at lower volumes than that. And in many kind of mid-season sort of spray applications with normal products, you know, there would be research there that would support that you can probably come back towards 100 litres per hectare. But if you're in your potato crop, Shea, as you know well, and indeed your ear spray with, you know, uh, different sort of fungicide products on wheat and so on, a higher volume may be better in that scenario. So you need to consider volume very, very carefully. There is scope to reduce volume with some products, but not necessarily with all products in all situations. And while we're talking about that, Dermot, is there any other technologies that guys can use to, to try and reduce drift? Uh, 
Yeah, look, you mentioned some of them already with Francis in terms of, say, pressure and so on. Also, the height of the boom, keeping it as low as possible is very important. In terms of other technologies, then, um, outside of ordinary kind of nozzles, you have the air blast sprayer, you know, the Hardy twin type, which uses conventional nozzles, but kind of forces it into the crop with a blast of air. And that allows you have you know, the, the, the finer or medium spray quality if you need it, but you still have something that's controlled and drift. So it's a good technology, but more expensive. Something that has a bit of interest lately is, you know, charge droplets, if you like. In the past, there were systems. And again, there's a magnet system. Magro have a system out now, which will reduce drift to some extent, but probably less tried than some of the products that are there. So there are different technologies, different costs as well. The air induction nozzles are probably the least expensive means of, of drift reduction. Yeah, and, and for most for most guys, they give good enough coverage for what they're trying to do. Thanks for that, Darren. Kieran, just to move on to you, I mean, a lot of the problems we're hearing in terms of uh, pesticides in, in water are coming from the grassland side, specifically probably MCPA. Are there products that tillage farmers should be aware of in terms of their limits with stripe and so on? Yeah, she, I suppose MCPA is the obvious one. Uh, 75% of exceedances tend to come from MCPA. And I suppose, you know, that's obvious in terms of where that's typically used in terms of runoff, leaching and that. Um, so obviously that emphasizes the importance of, you know, um, ground conditions when you're spraying and obviously uh, obeying stripe as well. That would be a crucial one. I suppose in terms of the, the, the general run of products that we use on, on tillage crops, I would say the vast majority would have a five meter buffer zone, but there would be some that would be much wider than that. You'd have, we'll see your likes of Proline would be five. You'd likes of a lattice era then would be, would be 10 meters. Um, Turn or Winger would be 15. And that's an interesting one. It's the only one as far as I know, I'm aware that's non-reducible. So just, just important to note that. And then you have newer products and I, you know, the likes of Questar, which would be an in, the inner track product this year would be 30 meters. So it is important to, to consult the label and to be just aware of, uh, of the buffer zones. And also, I suppose, when you have a number of products in the tank, obviously it's the one with the highest buffer zone is, is the one that you go by. And maybe I, I should also say as well, and hopefully it came across in the little video there, but, you know, it's where anywhere there's a there's a water body. You know, obviously, if it's a, an ordinary hedgerow, that's that's absolutely fine. It's just where it's, you know, we're concerned with pesticides getting into water. OK, listen, thanks, Karen and lads, for that. Look, there's questions coming in and we'll try and answer them off air if we can, They're just trying to keep the thing moving along. So our next section is looking at winter cereals. So we have reports from winter wheat, winter barley and winter oats. So I'm going over to, I think, Elaine Clifford first uh, from winter barley. Okay, so I'm in East Cork in a field of Joyo winter barley that was sown on the 8th of October. So Joyo is the uh, BY, BYDV tolerant variety. And as you can see, it's quite an early developer. We're at on emergent stage here. Uh, in terms of the crop development during the year, uh, it established very well. Uh, there was some wrinkle in this crop in around growth stage 30. Now it probably could have justified a fungicide at that stage, uh, but the dry weather at the time um, certainly slowed down that wrinkle. It got a T1 uh, fungicide of proline and modem at growth stage 31, 32. So as you can see, it's now at the stage for the uh, final fungicide at on emergence. In terms of growth regulation, it got a growth regulator at growth stage 30, which was a modus and cycocell combination. Uh, the plan was to give it an additional growth regulator in around flag leaf. That didn't happen because the crop was under a bit of stress at the time. Um, due to a combination of the previous growth regulator, fungicide application and frost at the time. So obviously we're, we're, we're beyond the stage now of any further growth regulation, but given the height of the crop uh, and experience from both the breather and the Department of Agriculture in that this variety it has um, good resistance to lodging, we're happy enough to uh, just go with the final fungicide now, which will happen in the next few days. Right, we're here in Kildalton College uh, in a crop of uh, Infinity Winter Barley. It's at growth stages that is uh, flag leaf emergence. Um, crops under a bit of pressure from 
a recent application of, of growth regulator about five days ago. Um, disease is, is low in the crop, it's a clean crop. Um, back on the 30th of March, it got uh, proline and comet, along with modus and uh, psychocell as a growth regulator. And then on the 23rd of April, just a few days ago there, it got uh, a fulpit and turple. And we'll get uh, Syriax and another uh, shot of fulpit at on emergence uh, in, a, in a short period of time. So this crop got 165 kilos per hectare of nitrogen, which is 132 units, plus farmyard manure. So that's the reason why it got the two growth regulators at, at those two timings. Um, the crop is struggling a little bit at the moment after the last growth regulator a few days ago and could do with some, some kinder weather to improve growth. Winter barley in North Dublin is currently very mixed this year, similar to Kieran and Cork. Jayu is at growth stage 49, on's emerging, while Cassia, Valerie and Infinity are only between growth stage 32 to 39 stem elongation. In terms of disease, Cassia and Valerie are showing signs of rhynchosporium while Infinity is relatively clean. Today I'm here standing in a crop of six row hybrid winter barley sown on the 14th of October, which is following a crop of, of winter wheat. To date it has received an autumn herbicide, 160 units of nitrogen, 21 units of P and 160 units of K per acre. At growth stage 31, it received its first fungicide and that comprised of MacFair at 1 litre per hectare along with a manganese trace element and a growth regulator of Medix Max at 0.4 of a kilo per hectare. Now it's just approaching growth stage 37. Despite receiving an application of a PGR at growth stage 31, the crop is taller than we would like to see, especially on an exposed site like we have um, in this field. As a result, a second application of a growth regulator turple at one litre per hectare is required in the coming days. The final fungicide will be at ons emerging and with disease pressure moderate um, and ramillaria control in mind the recommendation will comprise of Revistar at 0 0.8 litre per hectare along with uh, Falpet at 1.5 litres per hectare. So in summary, due to the large variation in growth stage and disease pressure across crops of winter barley this year, walking crops is vital to identify the ideal time for the second PGR if necessary and the correct timing of the final fungicide. So we're here in East Cork looking at a crop of winter oats and the variety is husky and it was sown on the 5th of November. Uh, to date this crop has gotten its weed spray and an application of Psychocell for growth regulation at growth stage 30. Uh, looking at the crop now today it's at growth stage 32 um, and it hasn't got a fungicide application yet. But having a good look across the field, um, disease pressure is low um, there is no sign of mildew or, or rust in the field. So it's a good timing now for its fungicide application and talking to the farmer, it's going to get a lattice era and its growth regulation, its second application of, of Medix Max and Psychocell. Um, just to make a comment on the winter oak crops in, in my area in East Cork, they're re fairly clean at the moment. Um, there's been no sign of mildew to date anyway, and small reports of rust in the area. So looking across the crop, it's a small bit off colour. Um, it's possibly a result of the cool conditions that we've had recently with, with low growth rates. Um, it would be fairly representative of the winter oak crops in East Cork. Um, now it has got its full nitrogen application, but it's just not showing signs of it quite yet. Um, it has a bit, a bit of growth left to do. We're here in a field of husky winter oats in Kildalton College. Uh, the plant is currently at uh, flag leaf emergence. So we were in this crop a month ago for the last webinar and it has remained exceptionally clean throughout, throughout the season. So all the nitrogen was applied by growth stage 32 and this plant, this crop received 105 kgs of nitrogen per hectare but it also received farmyard manure at so on time. It's important to monitor the nitrogen application on winter oats as the, the higher the nitrogen application it might decrease the hectare litre weight. Um, it received its T2 fungicide application two days ago. It received Rubit, Comet and Talius. Um, the plant is on a split growth regulator program. It would have received C-Rate back in March and it received two litres of Cycocell at growth stage 32. So the plan with this crop for the remainder of the year is to apply the T3 uh, 
or the or the heading out spray when the when the when when the ear is is fifty percent emerged and it's going to get a lattice ear at. Um, I'm here in a crop of Barrow Winter Oats in County Kildare. This crop was drilled on the 15th and 16th of October last year. Crop grew pretty well over the winter, no sign of flooding or anything like that. Um, and coming into spring then, it got its uh, nitrogen. So it's got, at this stage, it's got 120 kilos of nitrogen. The crop is after peas, so there isn't a huge demand for, for nitrogen here. Um, in terms of the first growth regulator, this, it has already got serrated uh, with that uh, with the first herbicide here, which is Cameo Max. There's no evidence of any uh, weed resistance here, so it's just got Cameo Max. And also got its first fungicide at that timing as well. So in regards to the second growth regulator, we know from, from Trials in Oak Park that growth stage 32 is the ideal time uh, that for growth regulation in oats is the time you're going to get the most benefit from a PGR in oats. So that this crop here behind me has received it here just last week, so it was actually absolutely ideal. Uh, that said, it was a little bit cold as the weather has been through April. Um, but that while that does cause a problem in terms of maybe scorch, we've seen scorch around different crops, it also has reduced the risk of disease in, in crops like this. So Barra is particularly benefiting this year. Very little mildew in Barra around this part of the world this year. So you know we were able to cut back the rates of the decoy comet in, in that regard. Um, crop like other crops around the country and like the lads have mentioned, just it just looks a little bit um, a little bit pale at the moment from that cold weather and needs a, a bit of growth just to get it going. In terms of the final spray then, we'll put the final fungicide on this uh, probably sometime around 10th, 15th of May um, when, the, when the head is just coming out uh, and that will be something like a lattice era uh, at that stage. So we'll, we'll wait and see. Maybe the disease pressure will stay low and we might be able to make a few more savings at that stage as well. So again, I'm here in a, in a crop of winter wheat, which was drilled on the, the 8th of October. Uh, the variety is, is Graham, um, and it's following a crop of a winter oats on a continuous tillage site. Um, again, it, it, it got a, a pre-emerge um, application of, of Stomp Aqua at 2.5 litres per hectare, um, along with Hurricane at, at a quarter of a litre per hectare. Um, in the spring then, the same crop received, sorry, the 20th of March, the crop received an application of Broadway Star, 240 grams per hectare, um, and Torpedo 2 at 200 mils per hectare, um, along with trace, the trace elements Mantrack at half a litre per hectare and half a litre of Zinc Track as well. Um, it received uh, Cycacel at uh, 2 litres per hectare on the 13th of, of April, along with um, another half litre of Mantrack and half litre of Zinc Track as well. So again, I suppose the, the timing for the T1 application, we're looking for the third last leaf to be fully out. Um, and in the case of this tiller, we have a third leaf, leaf uh, fully out and unfolded with maybe something in the region of close enough to somewhere between 30 and 40% of the second last leaf out. So you're going to get chemical coverage on the second last leaf as well. Um, the fourth last leaf at the, the upper end of the leaf, again, we can see that, that septoria uh, is present um, on leaf four. Um, with a very considerable level of septoria present um, on leaf five of the plant. So the plan here is to apply um, a T1 um, on, the, on this crop um, in the common, uh, inside of a day or that, right? Um, again, I suppose the product that we're going to use um, is uh, Elatazira, a 0.9 of a litre per hectare, along with the multi-site product Fulpot at 1.5 um, litres per hectare. In Johnstown Castle here there's there's only been 2.7 millimetres of rainfall uh, recorded for the month of April so disease pressure here is, is actually quite low running up to the T1. So we're here in a proper winter wheat in East Cork and um, it was sown on the 5th of November and the variety is Castello. Looking at the crop at the minute the growth stage is 32 um, you can see that it's suffering the effects of a recent weed spray, um, which was Pacifica. So the crop is a small bit under, under pressure, but the disease pressure is moderate at the moment here in East Cork. Um, septoria levels, um, you can see it on leaf five and only a small bit on leaf four at the moment. So looking at leaf emergence in this crop, leaf three is 
70 to 80 percent emerged um taking an average across the field so for a t1 spray we're looking at the the last few days of april maybe the 30th of april depending on weather and in the case on this farm the farmer is going to go with um a lentima spray and then taking into account i suppose leaf emergence and estimating for the the flag leaf emer fully emerged we're looking at possibly the 20th of May, maybe a, bit, a few days sooner. Um, and again, in this case, the farmer is considering um, using Inatrek, depending on the level of septoria in the field. I'm standing here in Dublin in a crop of Bennington winter wheat sown on the 26th of October, which is following a crop of spring beans. It received an autumn herbicide to control grass and broadleaf weeds, while volunteer beans were controlled in the spring with an application of Zyper. To date, this crop has received 140 units of nitrogen, 18 units of phosphorus, and 80 units of potash per acre. Unlike the crops Elaine and John mentioned, we, ex we ex experienced early problems with rust, which was first noticed four weeks ago. Consequently, our T0 quickly followed this finding with an application of Osterus P plus Comet to control the rust. Two weeks later, the crop received its PGR with uh, two litres of Psychocell per hectare. While the T0 controlled the rust, the problem is starting to become visible again throughout the crop. While levels of satori are low, unlike what Elaine is seeing in Cork, looking at this crop, the third last leaf is almost fully emerged, indicating the ideal application timing for T1 as mentioned by both Elaine and John. For this crop, we need to select uh, products that are effective against rust, such as Alatus era. So the recommendation for this crop is a full rate of Alatus era, along with 1.5 litres of fall pet. Variety has played a large part in disease pressure in this part of the country. In contrast to the field of Bennington just discussed on the other side of the hedge, this field of Costello I'm in here now has shown no signs of rust so far this year and septoria pressure is also low due to the low rainfall amounts. This signifies the importance of walking crops before applying fungicides. This crop will receive Basker Expro at 1.25 litres per hectare plus 1.5 litres of fall pet. So, in summary, we have seen there is both differences across regions and within regions in terms of disease pressure being found in winter wheat crops. With this in mind, select the appropriate products for the problem identified in the crop, alternate active ingredients used to avoid resistance, and monitor crops to identify when leaf tree is fully emerged for the ideal T1 timing. Okay, okay, again, thanks to all the contributors there. Thanks to all the advisors out in the field who are reporting back on those crops. Seeing as we finished up with winter oats, or winter wheat, I should say, we're going to stay with winter wheat. And John, I just saw you were re uh, reporting on a crop down in Wexford. Um, fair to say that disease pressure is low down there, seeing as you had such, such low rainfall in April. Um, any thoughts on where you might go in terms of the flag leaf spray or what you might, products you might consider for a flag leaf spray in the sort of low, low pressure situation? Yeah, I suppose, Shay, for the month of um, April in Johnstown, in the run-up to a T1 ap application, we only had 2.7 millimetres of rainfall, so disease pressure was very low. Um, but again, like between a T1 and a T2, that could all change. So it'll be dictated, what's used in a T2 will be largely dictated by what weather is shown us between now and T2. So if we see a significant amount of rainfall events, that's going to increase septoria pressure dramatically. And in a situation like that, you'd be looking for a product or products that have strong curative activity. So your newer chemistries, such as an Inatrek type product um, or the likes of a Rebby Star, along with the inclusion of a multi-site would probably be the way to go in that situation. Yeah, and I was noticing there, there was different recommendations coming in from the different from yourself, was different from Elaine, which was different from Connor. So in terms of mixing up and matching products, I mean, alternating products is probably the way you'd be looking to go, I presume. Yeah, it's again, Shay, as an anti-resistant strategy, because again, some of our newer actives only have a single site um, mode of action. So it's hugely important that um, the same products are, are protected, that we get longevity out and going forward. Um, so it's, as you mentioned, it's hugely important that we alternate products and, and different active ingredients.
Okay, and, and fault better, I presume, will go into to the second application as well. Just in to all cases, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, listen, thanks, John. Mark, just moving over to you, then we haven't heard from you yet on winter barley. Um, I noticed there again, crops you were saying are under pressure and under stress. Are you seeing, are they still near odds merging in Kenny yet? A very variable, Shay. Um, so some are at likes of Joyo that we saw there in one of the videos. It's it's a, uh, it's it's more more further on, I suppose, and we are seeing some odds merging there. But then other other uh, two rows are are a little bit behind that. So like Connor was saying, it's it's it is vitally important to get out into the field and, and walk these crops uh, to see where they're at and and get that timing right for the uh, for the final spray at on emergence. And in terms of that, what what are you thinking? In terms of product choice in Kilkenny, what's what's your thought? Yeah, well, I suppose look at Ramularia is the is the what we're trying to combat against at this stage, and um, with them like like everywhere crops being under pressure there in, in, in April, it might it it would be more susceptible to that maybe. So it's it's important that they get on uh, at the right time. Unfortunately, chlorothanolil being gone, and uh, none of the replacements are as good. But the 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 likes of Falpus, Revisol, Pythiaconazole. All have have uh, efficacy on on ramillaria, so uh, definitely the a bit like the the wheat, the, the liter and a half of fulpus, along with with half rate um, azole and and, and uh, straw probably would be the, the way to go in that final spray. And as you say, ideally timed as the yawns are just coming out rather than leaving them to to head out fully. Yes, definitely. Just uh, just in that that paintbrush stage, as we call it, when they're just emerging rather than leaving uh, leaving it a bit further on. Yeah, and I think there was a good picture of of a, of a crop just like that, as you said, Joe, you earlier on as well. So, Kieran, just moving over to you then, in terms of maybe some of those early crops that are going to be sprayed this week, um, and some of the T threes or T leaf threes, should I say, on winter wheat as well. There's frost coming for later on this week, so. What can guys do in that scenario where they they still have to go the time the crop is where it needs to be at for that ideal timing? What can they do to reduce the stress on those crops? Yeah, she I, I I picked up and Connor said it a few times. You know how important it is to walk crops at the moment. You have to get in, look at the crop. Um, you know, in terms of growth regulation, I suppose that's the number one question I've got in terms of winter barley. Definitely in the last week or ten days, you know, people might have planned say a second growth regulator in around growth stage 37, 39, you know, they're, they're walking the crop now, they're finding a crop that's under stress from maybe previous applications and that, and like you, you, you just can't apply a growth regulator on a crop that's, that's under stress. And as you mentioned there, there's frost coming this week. So you really need to get out into the field and, and, and assess, you know, where the crop is in terms of the growth stage um you know in terms of the density of the crop you know the risk to lodging you know we you know look up the, the recommended list in terms of of the variety ratings that kind of thing i i think in certainly in terms of winter barley growth regulation it's not a binary yes no answer like i say you have to or connor said you have to go out and see what's in front of you i would think if it's a high risk situation say a variety with a poor um a poor resistance to lodging high nitrogen and maybe a thicker crop I would be inclined to leave it as late as I possibly could to do that. You know, you certainly, and just want to repeat it, like not apply growth regulators and, and crops that are under stress. I think that would be, that would be my big one, really, Shay. And on that, Kieran, have you any experience of, say, like of seaweeds or anything like that to try and reduce or, or, or any of those products to try amino acids to try and reduce stress on yeah. crops? Yeah, look, there, there, there are a few products on the market now, um, you know, the likes of seaweed. And I suppose when you when you look up some of the some of the stuff behind it, you know, they, they, they can possibly have an effect. Unfortunately, I suppose from a Chagas perspective, we don't really have any solid information that we can give to growers other than, you know, I suppose that, you know, there are some 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 bits of information there that they can help to reduce stress. But look, from a Chagas perspective, we haven't, uh, you know, uh, full trials done in the chit yeah. Okay, listen, thanks, lads. We'll come, we can come back to this later on. Just in, interested in, or in, uh, trying to get back on time. So we'll move on to the next section, which is looking at spring crops. So we'll be looking at spring barley, beans. But again, Kieran, I think you were starting this one on, on fodder beet. Okay, so just a short update on fodder beet weed control. Traditionally, we would use a debut type program 
for the first herbicide application on fodder beet. So the debut type program is widely used because it can, covers a broad range of weeds and is particularly good on difficult to control brassica weeds. So typically that program would have contained debut, Beetnol Max Pro, Venzer, plus or minus Galtix depending on the weed spectrum and plus or minus oil depending on the size of the weeds. So the big change this year is that desmedifen is no longer available and that would have been a key component in Beetnol Max Pro. So this year we will be replacing Beetnol Max Pro with straight products of Fenmedifen and Ethfumazate. So typically where you would have been using say 0.5 a liter per hectare of Beetnol Max Pro in your T1 herbicide on, on fodder beet, this year we'll be, you would be replacing that with the likes of Fenmedifen products like Beetnol Flow or Beetnol Upflow at 0.4 to 0.5 a liter per hectare or Ethfumazate uh, which is in the likes of Oblix or Nortron at 0.1 to 0.2 of a liter per hectare. So those rates would typically be for crops at expanded cotyledon stage and would need to be adjusted back a bit if the beet is, is a bit smaller than that. And just finally, in terms of or in light of current conditions, very important if crops are under stress from drought or nutrient stress to hold off that first application until the fodder beet recovers. Okay, so I'm here in Oak Park with uh, Dr. Stephen Kilday. We're just in the bean plots here. Uh, as you can see behind me here, we've various different plots here behind us. Uh, and basically what these plots are designed to do is to look at some of the key agronomy issues in beans. So these plots here were sown in around the middle of, middle of March uh, at different seeding rates, anything from 30, 30 seeds per square metre up to over 60 seeds per square metre. And the idea here is just to look at those different seed rates and see which is the most beneficial in Irish context. So generally we look at trying to sow 40 to 45 seeds per square metre to try and establish 30 to 35 plants per square metre. And that's kind of a target here for some of these plots. All of these plots would have been sprayed then at, at sowing time with Nirvana at about four litres per hectare. Um, and if any other um, volunteer cereals or, or grass weeds come up, we can always put on a graminicide afterwards. So the next job to be done with this is to look at this crop from the point of view of pests and the main pest we're concerned about at the moment is bean weevils and we can see some notching in the leaves here. So we start at the hedges and look at the look from the hedges out to see if there's any weevil damage over there and then we move in towards the centre of the field. If we're finding uh, weevil damage in the centre of the field well, then it probably merits a pyretride insecticide at that stage. Um, after that then we're looking at disease control and I'm going to just hand you over to Stephen just to talk about the main disease in beans which is probably chocolate spot. Indeed yeah so I suppose as, as Shea says the main disease in beans um, from around this time really going forward will be chocolate spot. It's a, it's a wet weather disease mainly so it'll be I suppose predominantly most along the coast and, then, and moving inlands from that and, and then of course it will depend on the weather. So a wet summer and you'll, you'd expect to have quite a bit of chocolate spot. Um, the disease itself is caused by Botrytis fabia. That's now it's 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 similar to that grey mold type fungus that you would see, say, on strawberries and things like that, and it's it's specific to beans, um, and it can cause a significant sort of impact if it does get in. Normally, you might see it as I suppose as the name describes as a chocolate spot. It's a little brown sort of spot that occurs on the leaves, um, and once inoculum builds up there, it can get into sort of on a very aggressive type of phase, where actually you'll get start to see leaf defoliation, etc. Um, in terms of controlling it, look, we're limited in, in, in the number of fungicides that we have available for it. So it's really about getting that timing right for those fungicides. And at the moment, Stephen, it's very dry. Is there any sign of any, any risk of chocolate spot in, in these in, sort of conditions? In, yeah, in, the spring, in these sort of spring crops, there's not an issue yet. You're really going to be looking at the timing and that's coming through into once it starts to flower. We've had a couple of very dry weeks. Look, if that was to push forward and that moved into June, into late May, into June, the risk will be significantly lower. If we have a wet period from now into June, that of course is going to drive up that risk actually aspect of it. And two other diseases, Stephen, that sometimes affect, affect beans are downy mildew and, and, and rust. Any, any comments on them? Yeah, absolutely. The downy mildew can look really, really bad in the field. You can see it and it, it sort of, it will hit it and stunt potentially the crops and it's very, very visual. In terms of its overall impact on yield, because it isn't as, I suppose, uniform across the field, it tends to occur in patches. It mightn't have that sort of significant impact on yield. Granted, where it is severe, of course it will have to be and will have to be controlled. Um, 
it is one thing that is it's a disease that really likes humid conditions um, and i suppose it, it's it's typical that that sort of late like like conditions and it's no surprise then that something like the phenylamide type fungicides are actually very very effective on it um, rust is the other disease again it's a bit more i suppose the slightly warmer type of conditions getting humidity etc and we probably would expect to see it a little bit later into the season um, and i suppose at that stage it will be not going to yield because it'll be hitting the, the plants when they're trying to fill the grains unlike the chocolate spot except it may not be as as uh, evident early on in the season okay Stephen listen thanks for that no problem so I'm here today in a crop of laureate malt and barley and this crop will be destined for the distilling market at harvest time if we get the correct protein so this crop is located just outside the town of Enniscorthy and the drilling date here was the 18th of March at a rate of 185 kilos to the hectare. So this is a, a typical sowing date um, for crops in the area. And what growers found difficult in the area was to get seabeds to dry out correctly pre-drilling. But this hasn't affected uh, plant counts, with the majority of plant counts in around the 300 plants per metre squared, which is on target. And this crop in front of me, in fact, is at 350 plants per metre squared. As this crop is destined for the distilling market, nitrogen management is key in order to ensure that we get a grain protein of 9.3% or less come harvest time. So the farmer here applied a total of 135 kilos of nitrogen to the hectare at the one leaf stage of crop growth. And this should ensure that we get the correct protein. So this crop is currently at the four leaf stage of crop growth and there's current key decisions that have to be made with regard to crop agronomy. These include aphid control, broadleaf weed control, and wild oak control. Firstly, with aphids. Chagas research has shown that crops emerging from mid-April on are at high risk of contracting BYDV from aphids, and therefore an application of insecticide on these crops will be necessary. This crop emerged in early April, so the decision will be made not to apply an insecticide to this crop. In relation to broadleaf weed control, it is important that we get correct control for spring barley as it could reduce yield significantly. A few key tips in relation to barley weed control and this crop will be to apply at the four leaf stage, so at the current growth stage that the crop is at. We also want to aim to apply the herbicide when the crop is actively growing. So a key tip is to apply the herbicide after four good days of crop growth and aim that there be four good days of crop growth after application as well. Also, before we choose a herbicide for this crop, we will walk the field to determine what harmful weeds are within the crop and then select a herbicide that will be most efficient at killing these weeds. So this farm here, like a lot of farms in Wexford, has a history of bad wild oats uh, within fields. So therefore, it is very important that we get good control with our wild oat herbicide. The plan here will be to apply the wild oat herbicide along with the first fungicide at that T1 timing or the mid tillering stage. The wild oat herbicide can also be applied earlier at the two leaf stage of crop growth or along with the broad leaf herbicide provided that a hormonal herbicide is not included in the mix. As regards our T1 on this crop, the variety here is laureate and it has very good characteristics in relation to disease. Therefore, the aim would be to apply a decai comet mix at half rate in order to control harmful diseases such as Rinko and Neplotch within the crop. So this is a crop of planet sown on the 21st of March. It was sown at about 180 kilos per hectare. It's now just at the four leaf stage. So the crop is established very, very well. It is a very good plant count and we're quite happy with the, with the establishment here. Um, as we walk through the field, we have a, a good flush of weeds. So we're ready at this stage now for our herbicide. And in this case, we have Fumatry, we have Volunteer Isleseed Rape, we have Sherlock, we have some Groundsel, and we have some Chickweed. So the plan in this field would be to use Galaxy at a litre per hectare in combination with a Sulfonyurea, possibly something like Presite Max or Harmony Max. So the plan for disease control with this crop of planet would be to target the late tillering stage. Uh, with our first fungicide and planet as we know is both a five for net blotch and a five for incasporium on the department recommended list 
So we know from past experience with this variety that there is an issue with both of those diseases. So we need to be mindful when choosing a fungicide. The plan for this crop is probably to use a proline based spray uh, in combination with a strobilurin to get that good control of both rinkisporium and net plotch that we're looking for. So the next decision we need to make in this crop is to determine whether or not it needs an aphicide to control aphids. The first thing we need to look at, as always, as always, is our IPM principles. We need to take into account sowing date. In our case, it's the 21st of March. Emergence was early April. And IPM tells us that crops emerging late March, early April are at low risk of BYDV. However, this field has a history of BYDV infection. And when we came in, we walked along the headland and we found aphids on the plant. So this is telling us it merits an application of a pyrethroid. I'm here in County Leash in a crop of Planet Spring Barley. This crop was one of the early drilled ones in this part of the world. It was drilled on the 5th and 6th of March. So it's a good bit ahead of where uh, the crops that Owen and Michael were looking at. Um, this was drilled at about 175 kilos a hectare, which looked a little bit high at the time. But given the fact that a lot of these crops that were drilled at that time were attacked by crows, it now looks to be a good decision in hindsight. Um, did a plant count on this in early April and a few other crops around here and they're coming in at around 300 to 320 plants per square metre. So the establishment has been okay even despite the, the, the attack of the crows. This crop here in particular here has got its nitrogen, it's a malting, it's for malting, so it got its top dress of nitrogen as the, as the tram lines were visible. So we're done from the point of view of nitrogen on this crop now. Um, like a lot of crops though, it has suffered quite a bit from manganese and magnesium deficiency due to the cold weather in April. So it, this crop has already got uh, a, a dose of uh, trace elements to try and rectify that. That said, unlike the crop that Michael was in, and like the crop that Owen was in, this hasn't received an insecticide and it won't receive an insecticide because again, the risk to this crop being an early sown crop, an early emerging crop is quite low. So we're not going to put an insecticide on this. From a point of view of weeds, there's no wild oats here. So the farm, the, or very few wild oats on this farm. So this farmer is not going to put a, a wild oat herbicide out the, on this. He's going to rogue any wild oats that are here, which makes the decision about our, our weed control quite simple. So in that regard, our plan here is to go with the weed control with our first fungicide somewhere around late tillering. Um, so the likelihood here, it'll be an SU something like Cameo Max, Calamar Max, something along the lines of that, plus or minus some mixer product, product, something like Hurler, Binder, uh, Cleave, something along that line. And we'll mix that then with our first fungicide, which will be proline based and, and a straw to keep on top of net blotch, which plant is, is, is pretty susceptible to. So that's the plan for this crop for the next couple of weeks. Okay, again, thanks to all the contributors there again. Uh, on this panel here, we're joined by all the contributors again, but we're also joined by Louise McNamara, who uh, looks after our, our, our AFA towers here in, in Oak Park. So Louise, I'm just going to go to you first on that. Mm -hmm. uh, what are we using those AFA towers for and when, what, can we use the figures from them yet? Yes, yeah, so we have um, an AFA tower in Cork and Oak Park, and we also are going to have one in Ashtown in Dublin, but at the moment we have a smaller portable one so we can still monitor there a bit. Um, so what the aphids tower can do at the moment is they can tell us the number of migrating aphids um, in the different locations, and each tower represents an 80 kilometre uh, area around the tower. And then longer term, we will be able to test the aphids for virus and resistance. So there'll be more information for the farmers. But at the moment, we just have the aphid numbers and the numbers at the moment. So we aren't, we haven't caught any aphids that vector BYDV yet. Uh, the numbers in Oak Park so far is five aphids have been caught so far, um, but they aren't BYDV vectors. Cork is 10, no BYDV vectors. And um, Ashtown, there's uh, a number as well, but no main pests for uh, BYDV. So although there is no thresholds in place, obviously, so I can't say when it gets to five or 10 or whatever you should spray, it still gives us an idea of what's happening out there. And then in contrast, if we look in the field, so that's obviously the ones uh, migrating at a long distance. In the field, we monitored some winter barley um, plots in the last couple of weeks at growth stage 31. The numbers in Carlo were quite low. They were uh, zero to four aphids per 50 tillers and they were twice as high in cork so that's just to give you an idea what a 
that's out there. But we can't, we can't. But there is no we, number, yeah, we, yeah that yes. tells us. Um, so you have to make your decisions based on the weather, uh, when you planted, if your area is high risk, if the history of the field of BYDV, and then also walking the crops and actually seeing if you see if it's there. So because there's no threshold, if you're seeing uh, if it's in your crop, that's considered a good reason to spray. Okay, and are, are you are you carrying out any other types of research on 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 different uh, viruses or or vectors or anything like that in in Oak Park? Yeah, so um, we have a project looking at Orpadi to determine um, if there's resistance issue with that. So obviously, we know there's resistance issues with grain aphid, um, and in the traps, we're actually seeing a lot of orpadi, more so than um, grain aphids in the last year. So we want to look at the relative importance of each of them as BYDV vectors. Um, and also, if the resistance issues are spreading to more vectors than just the grain aphid. OK, thanks for that, Louise. Oh, and just to switch to you, I mean, you, you gave a report there on spring barley. So you're probably best qualified to see more variety in terms of spring barley than anybody else. Um, What's your feeling in terms of the current conditions and herbicides this week? Should guys do them? Is there things they can do or not do in terms of weed control? Yeah, look, I suppose it's it's common there enough about spraying growth regulation and stuff that it's very tricky to get spraying carried out at the moment. And looking at the weather for next week, it's certainly for, for inland counties, it's going to be well below zero at night time. So really herbicides on spring barley this week, you know, the crop is kind of stressed there as it is. So hitting a bit of herbicide might not be the best thing to do. You know, even though crops are kind of, for the most part, you know, got four leaves or early tillering and, you know, weeds are kind of at the perfect stage to control them. But I think for the, for looking at the weather for the week, um, it might be best just to leave herbicide application off. Like you said in the video there too, that the um, T1 stage and try and control them then, even though, you know, weeds might be that bit bigger, it might be harder to control, but I think just trying to keep the, the stress off the crop is probably most important at this stage. Yeah. And seeing as you mentioned T1, Owen, any ideas what you're going to recommend for T1 applications of spring barley? Yeah, look, it's like was said in the videos there, you're looking at something like your proline plus your strab, and I suppose it's, it's the timing is kind of very important there at sort of your mid to late tillering to try and protect them tillers um, from like your net blotch and your rinko. Um, and even more important, I suppose, this year without floor tannin being used at T2, uh, we need to try and keep the stress off the crop to, to avoid ramillaria coming in. So that, that application at T1 will be very important uh, from that point of view as well. Okay, thanks, Owen. Just a couple of quick questions, guys. I'm going to ask you to try and be as brief as you possibly can because we're running out of time. John, Peter, just a quick question to you on wild oats in winter wheat crops. Some crops haven't been sprayed yet. Any recommendation what guys should do? Uh, so sports chain, you'll have a number of options. So um, you obviously have to like to cheat of extra, which is still, from a growth stage point of view, you can still use it up to growth stage 41. I think it's what's on the label. Um, axial as well can be applied quite late as well. So look at something like Cheat Extra um, or alternatively Axial with a, with a T1 if you haven't applied a T1 yet. But again, I suppose it's back to Owen's point. Again, just, just made, we just need to be conscious of weather conditions, again, regardless of what we put on a crop. Um, and putting a wild oat um, herbicide in a tank with a fungicide will um, increase the risk of scorching or damaging the crop as well. So... It's just, I suppose, whether we need to be hugely, important, uh, hugely conscious of it. Okay. Quick question on B, Kieran. Uh, any comments on mangle fly control? Yeah, um, I suppose the weather again. We're all the talk today is about the weather, but it's not really conducive, I suppose, at, at, at the moment. Um, it's difficult to control because, um, you know, we don't have dimetal weight anymore and, you know, you're spraying a big canopy at the time. So, there, look, if, if it is an issue, there, there, there are insecticides that are approved, so you, you, you can do that, but it's important to go in and monitor rather than just spraying, you know, because you had the problem in the past. Okay, see if thanks. the pest is there first. Thanks, Kieran. Dermot, a quick question. I, I, I don't see it on the screen here, but there was a question earlier on about charts and all that sort of thing for different nozzles. Where, where can people get those charts? Are they available from the manufacturers or where can you get them? They are, yeah. And I think Francis put an answer up there. So there's all of the manufacturers, the nozzle manufacturers like T-Jet, like Hypro, uh, like Leclerc, they all have very, very good information. More and more, Shea, as well, a lot of them have um, smartphone apps that helps you in terms of nozzle selection or in terms of the whole spraying operation. And 
Look, some of them are quite complex and some very good. You showed me one there last week, actually. So they're worth looking at as well. But yes, there's there's a huge amount of nozzle information on the web from the big manufacturers. Yeah, there was a spray assist app and it's kind of, it includes a lot of the nozzles that are available there, I think, doesn't it? Yeah, it's up to yourself to put yeah. in the nozzles yourself. Yeah. If you know exactly. what I mean, it'll, exactly. it'll give you guidance then, yeah. Okay, folks, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish it at that. We're just running out of time here. I just want to thank everybody for all their contributions, both people who made videos and had to make those videos, but also people who are contributing in any way. And some people are answering questions in the background here. So hopefully all your questions will have been answered. I'd like to thank Dara Whelan, who's hosting this, and Dara has hosted the last couple of webinars we've done. And without his help, I don't think we could have made these as successful as they, as they have been. Um, as I said earlier on, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our Chagas Crops YouTube channel later on today. So if you've missed any part of this or you're, if you've come late, go back, you'll be able to get the rest of the, the webinar from there. Also, keep an eye out for other social, other media um, uh, publications that we're doing. We have a weekly podcast called The Tealage Edge which gives good information, good insights from a lot of the staff that you would be familiar with in Chagas, but also gives contributions from other people out there as well. And we have some reports from people across Europe as well, and they're very well worth listening to. They give a very uh, interesting perspective of how crops are going in, in Europe as well. So from that point of view, that's all we have now. Hopefully, if regulations allow us, we may have another event in, in June whether that's a face-to-face -face event here in Oak Park or something, we're not sure yet. If not, we'll have a similar webinar type scenario as we have at the moment. So until then, we'll, we'll give you more information the closer we get to that. Uh, so until then, bye for now and hope to see you soon.